right, we're in. We're back. Hammer, thank you for joining us again to talk about uh, the markets, kind of what happened last week and what we think will happen this week. And um, welcome to Veda VA. If you're watching this for the first time, we're on our pros group and our main group and the YouTube channel just to be safe, to cover all bases. Nice, nice. Thanks for having me, Nathan. Yeah. Well, normally Christopher's on here with you, but he's actually traveling. I'm traveling, but I'm stable right now. So I wanted to hit it up and you just got back from traveling. So it's just going to be one of those weeks. I love it. I, so I, I think we should tell everybody my credentials though. So they know this comes from a place that they can trust. I am actually the cousin of the cousin of the in-law of Miss Chloe. And that's how come I'm really good at prognosticating. Remember Miss Chloe from the nineties? <laughs> The one nine hundred number, Miss Chloe. I, a lot of youngins, a lot of y'all millennials won't know what I'm talking about, but the Gen Xers will. The, the yeah. Miss Chloe, she was awesome. I totally do. Was that USA Tonight or whatever those those channels like Miss Chloe would always yeah. have her ads on there. Miss like, Chloe was always going to tell you your future on the one nine hundred number, and that was that's that right. Was the, Yep, that was it. So yeah, no, awesome. So um, actually, we had a couple of different agenda items today, right? We're going to take a look back and see what yeah. we talked about last week and how that compared to this week. And then we'll figure right. out what we think, you know, what kind of which direction rates are going in the near term, you know, for the week, and then maybe for a little bit longer, maybe, you know, through the end of the year, kind of what idea we have. And then I think you'd had a lot of questions on a particular topic, wasn't it? We have. We've got a lot of questions on the Zillow, the Zillow bombshell this last week. And is that going to affect our market? What can we maybe think about or what are we not considering that would that would lead to that? So let's dive into it. Let's let's look back first. Um, what do you got for us? Any thoughts, feelings, yeah. and emotions about the report? I'm, I'm going to um, share screen here. And if you don't mind... You turning that on and we'll go over we're going to go over some jargony stuff for y'all i'm going to going to break it down so it makes a little bit more sense what you see on the screen this is this is called a japanese candlestick chart and that's just a, a particular style of of charting that's used in economics and in the financial industries and it allows us to really have an idea of near term trends and mid term trends so this is actually just a lot of green and red lines that you guys see on the screen here. And I'm going to take a minute and just explain it to you and show you kind of what's the most important components. And that way, as we talk about uh, which direction we think things are going, we're going to be making references to these candlesticks. And this is called technical forecasting. So there's two things that are actually we look at when we're trying to figure out which direction mortgage rates are going and what's affecting the economy as a whole. And one of those things is the technicals. And technicals are all the charts and the graphs. So we're looking at the patterns the same way that, that traders and investors are looking at it to see what are the markets seeing. And based on that, what decisions might they make? And that's going to affect mortgage rates and pricing. And then the second thing is what we call the fundamentals. And that's the headlines. And that's everything that's going on out there. Like, for example, Biden's uh, Build Back Better you know, uh, plan. It's not a stimulus plan. It's an economic budget, actually. And that would be something we would say, hey, this may or may not be having an effect on mortgage rates. And here's why. And that's a fundamental. That's something happening outside of those technicals. So when we look at these technicals, it's, it's, I want to point out to you guys just real quick what they are. When you see green, that's generally good for your mortgage rates. And remember, when we talk about mortgage rates getting better, it's not always the rate itself. Sometimes it's that rebate pricing. And, and I always try to just you know clarify what rebate pricing is. Rebate pricing is the credit that you're getting towards your closing costs or the cost to obtain a better rate, which is often called points. So if you're trying to get to a better rate, you have to put a little bit of money in on that in order to make that work. And that's, that's what a rebate pricing is. So sometimes we see movement in the market and it makes it more or less profitable for the lender and they pass that along, but it's not enough to maybe mm -hmm. go from three and a quarter to three and an eighth. So it's not right. enough of an improvement to go from 3.25 to 3.125. So instead you maybe see 3.25, but you get a little bit back for, towards your closing costs. Something else right. is a little bit cheaper. So when we look at this here, let me, let me show you kind of this green candlestick right here. And hopefully that that's you guys are seeing that mouse movement here. And the, mm -hmm. the big fat part is called the body, right? And that's why the, I want you to think of it as a candlestick. That's why they call it a candlestick. And the top half, if we're thinking of it as a candlestick, this little thin section up there, Nathan, if it's a candlestick, what sticks out of the top of a candlestick? That's a wick. It's a wick. It's the wick. Yeah. So we've got our wick up top. And then, you know, just as uh, it makes common sense on how it would be named on the one that comes out of the bottom is called the tail. 
And oh. what this is, it's, it's actually much easier than what it looks here. When you see a body, that means that that's where the, the price started the day and where it ended the day. Each candlestick is one day. And when it's a green body, that means it started lower and it went up and improved. And the better that these bonds sell for, the more the more um, that they're going for, that they're trading for, the better that your pricing is, the better your rebate pricing, and eventually mortgage rates will actually improve on that. And when you see a red one, that's a bad one. That means we started up top and we ended the day at the bottom. So the body is where we definitely started and where we definitely ended. And then the wick okay. or the tail is where we were through that day, but it didn't stay there. So if we have a really long tail, it means it got really bad, but it recovered. And that's a good sign. And then if it's a really long wick, that means it got really good, but it couldn't hold it and it fell back down. So with, okay. with all of that, just to give everybody a little bit of backdrop of what we're looking at here, but what we're really looking at is, is a longer term trend. So I'm going to switch over to a mm -hmm. screenshot and I'm going to start drawing with some arrows for y'all. So what happens is, when we look at the dates and we look at September, the end of August and the early part of September, we saw mortgage rates move up. And again, it doesn't, it may, it may be a little bit uh, lender specific, some lenders more so than others based on their individual variables and their, their margins. But overall in the industry, we're going to see, we're going to see movement as a whole. So I always talk in averages. So from this point of the middle of September, right around September 13th until the end of October, right around the 20th, actually, we saw this movement down where we're following this arrow. And that means that as the price of these mortgage bonds went down, mortgage rates would actually go up. It's an inverse right. relationship. So the price goes down, yep. rates go up. Since then, <coughs> excuse me, since then, we have quite a bit of recovery, you'll see, and it's, it's, it's a, a very good V. So what I wanted to show you, forgive me, I'm going to, I have a tickle here. Mm -hmm. No worries. Sorry about that. So what I wanted to show you guys is that this red candlestick that you see, and in fact, the arrow is pointing to it right now, that was last week and that was the Fed meeting. And if I go back to our slides and we take a look at what we talked about last week, I said, that for last week, that rates would be volatile. Oops, sorry. Mm -hmm. That always does it when I move the mouse in Google. <coughs> <coughs> yep, I said, yep. this week we'll see two big events that could affect mortgage rates. The first is on Wednesday when the Fed will conclude that month's Fed meeting. And they're mm -hmm. going to release their policy statement and they're going to have their press conference. And that happened. Yep. And that's where we see this red candlestick right here, where for that day, it had an adverse effect. Things were not looking gotcha. so good that day. All right. Yep. And the second was on Friday when we're going to get the month's jobs report and unemployment data. And the potential for volatility makes it a good week to stay in touch with your mortgage professional. And that is what we talked about. So this yep. red one here, that made it look, we had this idea that, uh oh, maybe this is going to mean that rates are going to start to get a little bit worse. Just creep up a little bit, not any big moves, but we're maybe not pricing as well as we were, maybe a little bit higher rate. But then okay. the next day, things actually improved, which was a bit of a surprise. Now in September, mm -hmm. back here, this is when we had the other Fed meeting. So this mm -hmm. non-existent body with this movement, it shows you we had a lot of movement the day that the Fed spoke, just same circumstances what we had last week. And then the next day, we had a really large loss, yep. a really big red candlestick, which means this day was when rates actually jumped on most lenders about a quarter yep. point, Nathan, was yep. if you remember back, rates moved very quickly. So yep. we were kind of concerned concerned about that being a possibility and that didn't happen. And that's a good sign. What this tells us is that the, the markets and investors are comfortable with, with what they heard from the Fed and it matches up to mm -hmm. what they expected to happen. Mm -hmm. So that means that, that we should have a little bit of stability in rates as we're moving forward. Now, the big surprise though was on Friday and that's this really big green, green candlestick. And what happened is that for a lot of lenders, we normally, we would have advised consumers, our clients, like, like a lot of the people that may watch this, if you're in the vetted VA group, this is where I, we don't have a crystal ball. I'm not as good as Miss Chloe. So I, you know, we kind of have to do it more like Texas Hold'em. Right. And, and if, um, right. if anybody is a poker fan out there, you know, sometimes you've got great odds and, and you may be a 96% favorite to win the hand and there's one card to come, but that means that four times out of a hundred, that card is going to be the one card the other person needs to pull it out. 
And right. that's that's kind of what happened here is that all of the odds were that we would want to protect your pricing. You would want to consider locking in because we were expecting to see some real negative movements and see rates really just not, you know, not react well to that. And we got the data that we expected, which was that jobs data came in very strong. And there were actually, uh, I think it was over 500 jobs created when there were about 450,000 jobs expected. And this strong data would normally, we would see a, an event like this. We'd see a big red candlestick and pricing would get bad. Rates would get a little bit worse. And we, we would be like, oh, well, that's kind of, you know, it stinks, but we knew it was coming. And instead, I felt like I was in the twilight zone because <laughs> we had yep. all of the groundwork laid where we were expecting to see a negative reaction. And yet we right. saw a very positive reaction. And and you can turn off the screen share now if you want for a minute and, and just kind of put us up there because it's more comical to watch that look on my face like the kid from home alone. And you're like, ah, you're trying to figure out what was it that made this happen? And there's there's yep. a few different theories out there. Part of it is that other central banks, um, especially in Europe, that they are are having the same issues our own Fed is here. And they're trying to keep their economies moving because it was a global pandemic with COVID and, mm -hmm. and everybody had to deal with this. So the Bank of England was expected to start raising their interest rate and they didn't. And that had a bit of an effect because it trickles over on this side of the pond. Those investors were like, hey, uh, this was not what we were expecting. And that's very accommodative of keeping the economy moving. And that's usually good for bonds. And, and so there's some thought that there was that in there. I, I don't necessarily, you know, want to tell everybody that I know what caused it. It just what happens right. is once it started, it snowballs. And yep. now we now the big question is, you know, what's that mean for us heading into this week? You know, and so far it's actually been not too bad. Uh, I'm going to just look and see what the live live numbers are. A little bit worse than where we started today, but not terrible. And um, you know, right now it's it's tough to say where we're going to be as far as interest rates. Uh, except to say that they're not going to move too much. You know, we may get a right. little bit better. We may get a little bit worse. But overall, if you're out there house hunting right now, this isn't the week that you have to worry about getting surprised and having a rate that's much higher than you, what you expected. If you right. were thinking of refinancing, it's still a great time to talk to a mortgage professional. And and uh, am I allowed to say a vetted VA pro or do you guys not? Absolutely. No, okay, you can yeah. say it. I mean, we're, yeah, we're here to answer I, I, questions. Yeah. So, you know, and reach out to them and talk to them about different things, because um, we do anticipate rates, you know, squeaking up as they get closer towards the end of the year. And this has been a, um, a very uh, unusual reaction. And a part of it, by the way, too, is that stocks have actually improved. And normally there's an inverse relationship between stocks and mm -hmm. bonds for years up until almost up until uh, the last few years. And normally so people are either going to invest in, in bonds, which are boring, but their 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 safe return and I may get three percent return on my money, but I know that that's a good you know a good stable return. Whereas if you right. invest in stocks, you could lose your money. But right. what happens is as is investors, they'll take the money from their bond portfolio, move it into stocks when they're trying to get a better rate of return and they're willing to take that risk. And then they'll take that money from stocks when things look like they're going to be you know uh, volatile or they're afraid they may lose, and they'll put it into bonds so that they can just protect it while. While they're waiting yep. for that other volatility. Well, what we see happen now, though, is stocks have gone up and up and up. We're hitting new highs. It seems like every week there's new record highs in the Dow Jones and the S&P. And investors are at the same time that they're um, seeing those improvements in stocks, they need to make sure they're balancing some safety in their portfolio so that it's actually the tide is lifting all boats and it's bringing bonds with it because they're buying more bonds to protect from there. Um, so that's kind of the the the, the view on that. Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the the comments. If if anyone has any questions about you know what the Fed yeah. said and their interest rates that they remain the same or the tapering, we could talk about that. But it gets a little dry. Uh, but it was basically everything expected as as to what they had there. So um, and I, I think, think that's that a kind key. of that. yeah. Well, no, I said that's the key takeaway. I mean that that was a great summary. I love it. I love how uh, how you kind of articulated the candlestick and, and the transition there and just how, watching that V. But, but the articulated there is the Fed didn't say anything that shocked anybody. It was all kind of in line with expectations. So were the reports that were coming out that they've kind of reset their expectations, their portfolios, their performas. They're looking forward to saying, okay, we expect this to happen. And when it happens, you don't see knee-jerk reactions. You see, okay, it happening. It may not be the information we want to see to, to articulate a 
strong recovery or economy process, but it's not shocking. It was right. what in was fa- expected. In, in and, fact, and because sometimes of that, it's the opposite. What happens is the market reacts before they get the news and they overreact. And then that's why mm-hmm. when the news came and there was like, okay, that's about what we expected. There's no other surprises. Then it actually improved a little bit because it got yep. overly worse right before. And now it's got a little room. So we did, we saw that as well. So we're heading into, uh, we got veterans day on Thursday. We've got, um, thanks. Well, I should say the Marines would be super upset with me if I didn't say this first, right? Marine birthday is the 10th. Uh, so hoorah. Happy birthday, Marines. Uh, and then we have Veterans Day. And then we got Thanksgiving and the holidays and things just kind of in the mortgage world. We kind of see this as a little bit of a time to breathe. And there's a lot of breath happening. A lot of people aren't trying to trying to move their family uh, in the midst of November, December. So there's going to be some breath. There's going to be some slowdown in, the, in our industry as a whole a little bit. Um, but let's talk about that briefly. I know we've got just a few more minutes left of your time. And I super appreciate it when you carve this out to talk to us. So let's and we'll talk hit about on Zillow. that Zillow topic. Yeah, so let's jump right yeah, into the Zillow Let's topic, hit that so. because Zillow comes out and goes, yeah, we're done. Uh, they, they're going to back off, right? They lost $500 million in these transaction pieces. They've uh, they've got 8,500-ish um, you know, properties out there. They still have to sell. They're expecting to take anywhere from a 3 to 5 to possibly 7% loss in these properties. And, and the big takeaway in the industry, if you look at it, is like, oh, um, you know, the, the algorithm can't foretell the future of value. It's still, there's still a human element to it, which we've been saying, okay, we get that. The other thing about that though, is when you're developing a new algorithm, you expect loss and yeah, they saw a loss, but I wouldn't expect it to go away. I would expect that they're going to retool and revamp and reanalyze, but that's my thought. And yeah, what I, you got? I, I, I have to agree with you on that. I mean, as far as the first question, since my arena is the rates and the pricing, it's it's not going to affect mortgage rates at all. So there's nothing yeah. we have to worry about with this affecting rates. But how will it affect the market and the market moving forward? And, and I agree with you, Nathan. I mean, I think I, I I I don't. It's easy for me to throw stones, but I think it was mismanagement. I think they just didn't do it right. They didn't execute on it properly. They're a they're a sure. big company, and and things can go wrong. But what what they were doing is actually very sound because the analytics are there. We know that there's appreciation uh, where, where I think I think their particular set of analytics are wrong. We, we've always joked around in the mortgage industry that Zillow's estimates are you know terrible as far as accuracy, almost as bad as credit karma credit scores. And right, exactly. You know, there's just there's a few things as consumers that you think that you're getting good research and it's really just bad information. And we all know if, you know, if you're working on a premise with bad information, then things are not going to go well right from the beginning. And and I think that's really what happened here. I think that that they were were jumping in. I also think they bit off more than they could chew with the quantity of what they were buying yep. and just the number of houses. And right now, I, I know a lot of you are worried about what if I buy a house and the value of that house goes down. You know, what if I'm, am I buying at the top of the market? And that's that's a very real question. And I, I think to be fair to everybody, you have to recognize that there are some instances that some people will be buying at the top of the market for the foreseeable future, the next. In other words, it'll be the top of the market for a couple of years. Their house might lose a little bit of value after they buy it. And that's only going to be in certain markets of the United States. It's going to be in certain price ranges. Now, for example, affordable houses, and that word affordable is kind of vague, but how, you know, let's say houses generally around two to three hundred thousand dollars. They're very, very difficult to find almost anywhere. And those homes are not going to go back down in price because there is always going to be, and I say always, but for the foreseeable future, there's going to be a very strong demand. You know, anybody that can get a home. Remember, uh, Nathan, how many homes have you owned? Um, Three. Okay. Did you have a starter house? Oh yeah, of course. I bought. I bought in October of two thousand six at market high minus a little bit. Okay, so yeah, you did buy a a high at a high. Yeah, Yeah. I bought. I bought at high when we hit when we hit the bubble. So yeah. Right. And then, so, you know, and, and I remember my parents, they had a starter house and even me, it was a condo and it, I mean, that's just a housing type, but it was a cheaper property. And that was my starter house. My, my first condo, I paid $90,000 for in New Jersey. I sold it 
two years later for 160, I think. I mean, it just, wow. and, and that's why people are afraid of, of seeing that now. And, and um, yeah. one thing that, that you have to realize is that there's, there's, it's just supply and demand guys and, and gals. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to find is that the, the equity the, in other words, the then that's that's a thing that Christopher would would definitely jump on and talk about if we were talking mm -hmm. if he was on with us. He would talk about that no matter whether you have a mortgage or not, your equity is growing, and that your your net right. worth, your you know, uh, your your wealth is growing in that home, and it's it's going to grow. Even if you buy a house today and you found out a year now that it was worth a little bit less, in five years it, it's going to be worth right. more. And you so, bought in 2006. I think, the, it, I think that's the thing, right? Uh, that's where my house dropped drastically. I think I bought it for 185 and, and at the bottom of that barrel it was 135. But it actually because of some of the processing point, I still got out of it and made money out of it seven, uh, nine years later. It was nine years right. later. It, it took, so, took a little longer. Yeah, it took a little longer, but I did. And then the second house was I, I bought in location and made a lot more, a lot faster. Um, I think the whole thing about the Zillow news was there was two points of concern. Number one, is this the bubble? Is this right. the pop of the bubble? Right? Is this and the it, pin that hits it? It's not a bubble. It's not. Do you remember, do, it's not. Do you, do you go ahead and say with uh, say the second one, and then we'll come back to why it's not a bubble because a lot of people are going to go. Well, why is it and not the other a one was like. Yeah, and the other one is like, okay, well, if if it's not a bubble, then are we going to see now we get an influx of houses coming in back on the market or not selling and not moving and 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 you hit on that one? It's supply and demand. Actually, supply has been so low that it's been dry that demand is driving faster. But if anything, we're not talking a ton of houses. We're I think eighty five hundred was the the list nationally, and so. Yeah, our supply chain is still super, super short when it comes to house supply. So yeah. adding back some houses is not going to pop the bubble, but go ahead. You, you provide your answer. I was going to say, I could, I'll throw up on this one for everybody because I, I love this topic. So you've got two things that have come into play that, that we just talked about. And the supply and demand, why is there less supply? We have people that are living longer. We have people that are electing to stay at home and what they call age at home. Uh, we yeah. have, uh, you know, th those are two very big things. We have a big problem with lack of new homes being built, and that can be due to some mm -hmm. regulatory pressures. It's the costs of what it costs to build. And it's the fact of in 2008, when we did have the Great Recession and we had the mortgage implosion, we lost the trades. And yeah. we're trying to recover that now, but there are just people that never got to pass along their knowledge and that these people are, you know, so it's, it's, it's a very different workforce. We have, of course, supply chain issues that that are, you know, more of a, an issue right now. But, you know, it's been hard to get lumber and to get labor well before COVID. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a, that's going to continue. So we're not going to have a huge glut of property on there. Number one. Number two is that housing bubble issue. And the reason we had the housing bubble is because we it was irresponsible lending and we could we could lay blame. Personally, I put blame all on Wall Street because Wall Street mm -hmm. got very greedy. And I showed you guys all those fancy candles. And basically what all that, that those candlesticks are is when Wall Street is saying we want to buy these investments and and what happened is they were buying it and they were just feasting on all of this, these, these, these mortgages and they were buying them all up and they said, give us more. And we would say, well, the only way we could do more is if we lower our criteria so that we can get more people in more mortgages. And they said, that's fine. Give us more. And then they were like, okay, give us more. And we kept lowering our criteria yeah. until right. eventually we put people into homes that really couldn't afford them. And we were letting people speculate to become investors and they weren't putting putting yep. skin in the game. And we just did a lot of irresponsible lending and it, and it really kind of fell on everybody, but it really started at wall street. And that's not the case this time. I don't know where right. all the money is coming from, but the number of cash transactions are huge. The equity is huge. Everybody's able to make their payment. There was a term in 2009, 2010 called strategic default. It meant, well, I have the money to pay my bills, but you know the, the price of the house went out. So I'm going to let the bank take the loss and I'll take the hit on right. my credit rather than you know staying with the obligation that I took on and staying with the house. And sometimes right. you know there were people, um, which I'm not ashamed to admit, y'all, I, you know, I lost my house when all this went down. The mortgage industry, we lost our incomes. And there were a lot of people in, in my shoes and lots of industries where you just couldn't 
couldn't afford your mortgage payment anymore. Things had changed. And, uh, but there were a lot of people that could afford it and decided not to. And that's what really, you know, built up. Then we had too much supply. We had all these foreclosures hitting the market mm -hmm. and, and that's what caused all that. We don't have any of that this time. There's none of yep. that happening this time. That's why there's no right. housing bubble, you know? And in fact, the one thing that's only pushed values a little too fast is that everybody is so desperate for a home. They're, yep. you know, paying more, they're, they're, they're going up too fast. I'll pay this much we more see than this, what it's worth yep. today. That appraisal yeah. gap coverage and plus over, you know, if it appraises for this much, we'll guarantee to pay 50,000 over. Like it is that that's the thing, but that's, that's literally, ladies and gentlemen, that is supply and demand. That is Adam Smith's theory in work saying people will pay what they value and what they want to get. So the valuation there and what that is. And, um, Interesting topic. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to tee this one up. Maybe next week we can touch on this again and we can talk a little bit more about how generational growth has, is driving that supply and demand. Is that something you want to tackle? When you say generation, I mean, I'd love to tackle anything. I, I love that yeah. discussion. When so you take, say the, take, the, growth, uh, take the Gen Xers, take the Gen Ys. What am mm -hmm. I? I'm, I forget which millennial. I'm a, a 1970. I'm 1980. So whatever I am, but those that are younger you're, than you're me. You're on the millennial border. Yeah. I am. I'm, I'm, I'm literally crossing that border. So um, take, take some of those, but then let's talk about the supply and demand and how they're hitting their mid thirties now, early thirties, which is that home buyership level. And that's, what's actually driving a lot of our supply and demand is the live. And longer. that's where a lot of the money is coming from. Everybody was poking funds right. and they're living in, in mom and dad's basement. But while they were there, they, oddly enough, they, they saved a lot of money. They squirreled <laughs> away a lot of money. So yeah. And it's, and it's working out. I appreciate it. They're, they're bypassing that starter home. So yeah, that would be a great conversation yeah. to talk about next week. So. All right. Let's do that next week. Um, hey, y'all, I appreciate you being here. Hammer, thank you so much. I, you carve out time out of your busy schedule uh, weekly for us, and that's such a great blessing. So thanks for doing that, sir. No, and thank you for having me. I love sharing. I love being a part of the community. So if anyone does have any questions um, and you put yep. them on the post and in the comments, if you tag me, if you at Hammer, J Helmer is my name on Facebook. If you uh, if you do tag me, I, I will do my best to answer. Um, but I don't I sometimes miss them because I use Facebook for a lot of business. But if I if I see it, I, I will watch the thread and we can answer. We'll track. I'll make sure have. I'll make yeah. sure you get an alert and we'll let you yeah, know. So, so. Awesome. all right, man. Well, thank you so much. Have a great week. OK. Take care. Thanks, Nathan. Yep. Talk to you later.